Thanks very much, Nick, and thanks to BBS for the invitation to speak here. I'm absolutely delighted um, to see BBS in Newcastle. And I'd just like to echo the welcome that Terry gave just a little while ago and the Lord Mayor gave first thing in the morning. Um, as you can tell, I'm not from Newcastle originally. I, um, I'm from slightly further north, but I've lived here for 25 years. Newcastle is the most fantastic city, and I really hope that you'll uh, thoroughly enjoy yourselves here for the rest of the weekend. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some things around genes which I think are important in terms of uh, OI, a bit about genetics and a bit about us as geneticists. Terry's already alluded to this but um, you'll potentially come across us both um, with your children and yourself um, and I think sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about who we are and what we do. Um, I have never before in my life been referred to as a gorgeous geneticist except by Terry, um, so uh, I'll tell you about gorgeous <laughs> geneticists. Um, so um, when we talk about genetics it means all sorts of different things to different people and that's part of the problem. So if you talk to people about genetics they'll come up with all those sort of words in the top left hand corner there. Some people will think of um, the guy in the top right there. That's Gregor Mendel, who was an um, Austrian monk um, who played around with peas and all sorts of things, um, and really started some of the thinking which still we use today um, around uh, genetics. Um, for some people it's about the stuff in the bottom right there, about DNA, and we hear um, on a very regular basis now about DNA. And just as an aside, um, outside in the uh, uh, foyer there's a stand from uh, our local NIHR group and from 100,000 Genomes um, uh, Centre um, that is part of where I work um, and um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff and what is happening at a national level, go and have a look at that, There's some really interesting stuff out there. I think for many of us and for myself as a, a clinical geneticist, um, actually what this is really about is about our families um, and about our children. Um, so the two um, characters in the bottom left hand corner there, those are my children. Um, that, scarily that picture was taken almost exactly 20 years ago. Um, I, I had it in my head it was taken yesterday but apparently it was 20 years ago. Um, so uh, let's start with a few bits and pieces and numbers around um, genes and so on. Some of this may be old hat to some of you and if it is I apologise. Um, but I think it's the sort of stuff that um, is always worth just um, thinking about a little bit more before we get into some of the other things I want to talk about. So the, the, the numbers around our genes and our genetics are quite astonishing really. So we have got in every single cell in our, almost every cell in our body um, uh, complete sets of the instructions that require to make us. It's quite clever really isn't it? Um, and those instructions are um, 3,000 million separate instructions. Just amazing. So three billion separate instructions in every cell in our body. And what's really clever is it's packed up into little blocks that means that it can fit into our cells. And the packaging is enormously complex and enormously clever. Um, and so that you can get all of that stuff packed down into these tiny little blocks. And these blocks are our chromosomes. So that's the first um, bit of language. So our genes are the instructions that help make us who we are. And those genes are organized into these blocks that you'll hear people talking about. And those are our chromosomes. And they come as pairs um, because we get one from our mum and one from our dad. And if we have kids, um, our kids will inherit um, one of each from um, us and from, our, from whoever we decide to have children with. Um, what's even more remarkable um, is um, unless there are any identical twins in the room, in which case you are genetically 100% identical, um, the person sitting next to you, whether they are related to you or not, is 99.9% .9 genetically identical to you. It's quite amazing really, isn't it? But if you think about the numbers, so I said there were 3,000 million separate instructions, um, that means that if you do the maths, there are still, um, so 3,000 million, so that means that 10% uh, is 300 million, 1% is 30 million, so 0.1% 
is 3 million. So there are still 3 million differences between you and the person sitting next to you. Now, luckily, most of those are of no significance because most of our genes don't actually contain, in most of our DNA, sorry, doesn't actually contain genes, doesn't contain instructions um, for making things. Um, we're just beginning to understand, however, that that stuff that isn't really instructions is very, very important in the way that those instructions work. But most of those changes are out there in those bits that aren't real instructions. That's a picture of our chromosomes. Now, as geneticists, we almost never see that now um, because the way that we look at chromosomes has changed enormously, even in the last sort of, three or four years. And so now, instead of doing um, what was essentially sort of um, very clever um, a barcode reading, which is what cytogeneticists used to do, um, people who looked at chromosomes, we now smash them up into lots of little bits um, and use very clever computers to do all of that work for us. But that's what your chromosomes, these blocks that your genes come in, and remember I said they come as pairs, because you get one from your mum and one from your dad. And I've just highlighted there um, two genes that you've heard about already this morning. So in each of these chromosomes, there are thousands of genes. And we've heard already um, that two of those genes are very important in osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, a gene called Col1A1, which sits down on the bottom of chromosome 17, and a gene called Col1A2 that sits on the bottom of chromosome 7. I'll come back to those just in a minute. Some language, so we all talk in gobbledygook all the time and we all have various gobbledygook. My children talk in complete gobbledygook that I don't really understand, um, uh, which is probably deliberate. Um, but we as geneticists also have um, uh, words that we use all the time, um, which are often thrown out in presentations or in things in the media or when you go to clinics, which we shouldn't do, but we sometimes do do. Um, so here's a few of them that are probably quite important just for people to be aware of. So our genotype is our genetic constitution. So it's our genes. It's what our genes are and importantly how our genes either differ from uh, other people or from what we might expect them to be. That's our genotype. You'll hear people talking about phenotypes. You heard phenotype mentioned earlier on this morning. Our phenotype is just what we are. It's our physical characteristic and we also talk about behavioural phenotypes. So it's, it's who who we are um, and how we behave and what we look like rather than our genotype, what our genes are telling us to do. And it's very important that our phenotype is not an uh, uh, absolute consequence of our genotype. So our genotype is important in helping to make us who we are, but it does not define us. And then we hear about alleles. Alleles are just the name, fancy name, for copies of genes. Um, and then you'll hear these words also, um, heterozygotes and homozygotes. And those are just, um, again, fancy words for whether you happen to have the same copy of a gene that you got from your mum and your dad, or you've got slightly different copies. If you've got the same copy from your mum and your dad, you're what's called a homozygote. And if you've got a slightly different copy from your mum and your dad, then you're called heterozygous. And that's important in thinking about OI. So what are genes? Well, people have all sorts of different um, understandings of genes, and I've talked about some of that already. Um, but for us as geneticists, that's what they are. Genes are really simple things, but they do quite amazing, very complicated things. And they're just made up of four letters. So you, there only are four different um, instructions that you can have in a gene. And you, you, we read our genes in words, and those words are very simple words. They're only three letters long. And most of those words make um, things, make proteins, make our skin, make our hair, make our eyes, make our bones. Um, there are a lot of them that do other things and those other things are usually controlling the way that we make our skin or make our hair or make our bones. Um, and changes in those genes sometimes um, mean that that gene will work in a different way. It might work better um, and sometimes it doesn't work as well. Um, and that's where we come to the collagen genes because in OI most of what's going on are changes in the collagen genes or um, things which are important in the way that our collagen works, is made, um, is processed. Um, so changes in those genes um, or in the collagen genes themselves are the things which cause most of what we recognise as OI. 
Um, slightly complicated slide just to show, and don't worry about the detail, it's not important. It's just to show that there are a number of different ways in which genes can be changed. And the only reason that gene changes are important is that they affect the way that genes work. And that usually what they do is they mean that what those genes produce, the proteins that most genes produce, don't work as well as they should, uh, or in some cases aren't made at all. So what does that mean in OI? Um, those of you at the back won't necessarily be able to see this, but don't worry about that. Um, again, the detail isn't important, it's the principles which matter here. So in OI, what is happening is that we have two genes um, called Col1A1 and Col1A2, and they make this stuff called type 1 collagen. And type 1 collagen is really important in your bones. It's important in a couple of other things, but it's really, really important in your bones and in the strength of your bones. And if you alter um, type 1 collagen, then it can interfere with the strength of your bones, and that's why OI happens. Um, and the way that type 1 collagen works is it's like a rope, and it's um, bits of um, protein that are made by call 1A1 and call 1A2 twisted together to make a rope. And the reason that you get weakness in type 1 collagen is if there is a change in the instruction, which means that either you don't make as much of the rope because one of the strands is missing or some of the strands are missing, or because when you try to twist it all together, it doesn't twist properly um, because there's a change in some of the protein, which means that it can't form together to make a nice tight rope. And the specific change that you've got in the instruction, in part at least, in part at least, determines how significant that, gene ch uh, that protein change is, and therefore how severe the condition is. But we'll come back to the in part bit just in a moment. Now, in the last 20, so I started in genetics 25 years ago. Um, and in the first three years of my time in genetics, I did some work trying to find some genes for um, a different bone condition, not uh, OI, a different bone condition. Um, and we got beaten to it, just as an aside, by an American group by a day, which I've never forgotten, and I'm still incredibly bitter about, but anyway, that happened. Um, uh, and in those days, what we did was some enormously laborious work shown on the left-hand side there, um, where we used to smash up DNA into lots of little bits, and then we used to tag on radioactive things to it, and then we used to stick it in the freezer overnight, and then we used to get these things that you see on the left-hand side there that are called autorads. And it took us three years to do work which could now be done between now and the time that we're all going to sit down for dinner tonight. So that's the sort of change that there's been in our ability to analyse DNA and our genes and the instructions that help make us who we are. And the picture on the right there is the Sanger Centre in Cambridge, um, which is this enormous factory um, which does a lot of this work already in research terms and will soon be um, the centre for a lot of this work that will be done um, in the NHS as well. So dramatic changes in our ability to read our genes. The bit that's the challenge for us now is it is still very difficult for us to interpret what those genes mean. Um, and we're still um, struggling um, with our ability to fully understand that. And why is there such a lot of variability between the way that um, gene changes will affect different individuals? So. Um, Long before we knew all this, um, a guy called David Salens, who some of you will have uh, heard of, came up with this classification of OI. And the, part of the difficulty is that David Salens's classification of OI was nothing to do with the gene changes that cause OI. He was describing the patterns. He was describing the phenotype. Remember we talked about phenotype? He was describing the pattern that he was seeing in people with OI. And so that doesn't directly, and those four classifications, don't directly link to the genotype, the genetic basis of the condition. But we know that those four types of OI almost universally are caused by changes in the genes that make type 1 collagen. And different changes cause slightly different patterns. We've now got all these other forms of OI, which are much rarer than these first four and where those are largely now determined by um, specific changes in individual genes. So we've got a bit of a 
mixed bag here where the first four types of OI are descriptions of a particular pattern and the, the newer types of OI, if you like, the ones that have been described more recently, generally are descriptions of particular patterns but particular patterns which are linked to specific gene changes. And those are often forms of OI that in, in, in the way they are inherited behave in a slightly different way from the more common types of OI and that's where this word homozygous comes in. So in the um, first four types of OI, usually people who have one of those four types of OI have a change in one copy of a gene, and it's usually one of the collagen genes, one of the type 1 collagen genes. People who have these rarer forms of OI often have changes in both copies of a gene, um, and a gene which is involved not in making collagen directly, not in the collagen protein itself, but in making proteins which are important in the way that that collagen protein is produced. So let's come back to our, what I spend most of my time doing. So I spend no time um, in a laboratory as a clinical geneticist. I spend all of my time um, seeing patients. So let's think about families. So for many people in the room um, who have OI, their families may look a little bit like this. So geneticists have this peculiar way of drawing. Um, and what that means is that we draw people as squares um, if they are male, um, or as circles if they are female. <coughs> and we fill them in in colours if they have the condition that we're interested in. So that diagram means that we've got three generations of a family. So we've got two grandparents and um, a parent, a, a father, um, who has a daughter who has OI in this case, and his sister and his brother also have OI, and he also has a sister who doesn't have OI. And his father, the grandfather of the little girl who has OI, also has OI. So how do we explain that in genetic terms? Well, what's going on there, um, and here what we've got is the, uh, the colored bars are the copies of the gene which are important, in this case, the collagen genes. So let's imagine this is call 1A1. And in this case, what we're saying is the, pers the red bar is the type copy of the collagen gene which has got a change in it. So the grandfather and his son and his granddaughter all have that red bar which is the copy of the collagen gene which has got a change in it which is why they have OI. So why have I coloured in the sister and the brother of the guy who has OI in grey rather than in black? It's because it's to illustrate the fact that as all of you know within families um, where people, more than one person have OI, we often see a lot of variability in the severity of the OI. So the degrees of greyness are to represent degrees of severity. But yet they've all got exactly the same genetic change because they've all inherited that genetic change from their father. So they've all got the same genetic change, but there's enormous variability in the severity. And that's the bit that it's important for us to try to understand and is really quite difficult for us to understand, but that's where we are now. So we understand the basic genetics. The clever bit is understanding the variability. Now in some families we'll see this sort of pattern. So we see someone, and in a lot of families that we see, probably about half, even more than half of the families that we see, um, we see a situation where there is a child who has a Y and neither of their parents has it. And if you're able to look at their genes, you'll find that neither parent has the gene change that their child has. And that's because we all have gene changes that occur between us and our parents. So in other words, my copies of all of, if we, if we took all of my genes and read them all, which is relatively easy to do now actually, um, and compared them to my parents, we would find that some of my genes are slightly different from my parents. And I would probably have some changes in some of my genes which are important to me that may well cause me problems in the future that I don't know anything about and I don't want to know about. Um, that my parents didn't have. And you can see that situation in OI as well. So that's why we see a situation where there are children in families who have OI where neither of their parents have OI. And that's the most common reason. So it's a new event, a new gene change um, that's occurred in that child. Most importantly, not something that either parent has caused to happen. 
It's a natural event, chance event, not caused by anything that, they, that did or did not happen before or during pregnancy. But it also means, of course, <coughs> that the children of that person can go on and develop OI as well. They can inherit OI from them. And in some families, um, people want to know whether or not that's going to happen. And if we know what the underlying genetic change is, then it's possible for us to tell people during pregnancies whether or not the child's going to have OI, even before we can see whether or not there are any fractures on X-ray. Difficulty is we can't tell how severe their OI is going to be necessarily. We can give a broad idea, but we can't be absolutely specific about that. Um, and that's important in terms of the information that people get during pregnancies. Some families we see this situation, so there's more than one child in the, fam in the family who has OI, neither parent has OI. So what's happening there then? Well, there's a few explanations for that. One of them is this slightly complicated thing, which is called gonadal mosaicism. And in simple terms, what that means is that you can have a situation where in some of the sperm or egg cells, so rather than just in one sperm or egg cell, um, but in a group of sperm or egg cells, you have the genetic change which might lead to OI. And so you can then get a situation where one parent doesn't have OI themselves, has no problems with fractures, but might end up with a situation where they have more than one child um, with OI. And that's a slightly complicated thing, but we see it happening and we've, it is well recognised. We now know also, however, that in some cases this is because of this slightly different mechanism that I talked to earlier on, that particularly in some of the severer forms of OI, and there are some specific characteristics that pick out some of these forms of OI, Actually what's happening is that in order to have the condition you need not just a change in one copy of a gene but a change in both copies and that's particularly these genes that are involved in processing um, collagen not in making collagen. So um, what is it finally that geneticists do? So I'm a clinical geneticist. Um, I started off um, my working life um, as a cuddly paediatrician and moved to become a gorgeous geneticist in Terry's terms. Um, so I started off, so I'm medically trained, I've got a further um, scientific training um, and we're often, um, particularly those of us who are involved in seeing um, children are often people who started off in paediatrics. Um, why do we exist? Well, we exist for a number of reasons, partly um, around this business of trying to recognise what are rare um, conditions and why it fits into that group. Um, so we work a lot with paediatricians where there are doubts about an underlying diagnosis. So I spend a lot of time trying to work out what's going on often for children who have quite complex problems. Um, and some of us, quite a number of us, myself included, um, don't just have a diagnostic role but also have a, uh, um, a health care role, a therapeutic role if you like, are involved in helping to manage with all the other people you've heard from this morning and others that you're going to hear from shortly in managing rare conditions. And I suppose the difference between us and some other specialties perhaps is that we focus much more not just on the individual child or adult that we're seeing but also on the families and their familial implications. So if we think about what that means in Newcastle, um, so I work as part of a big team um, and a whole lot of different teams. So I work very closely with a lady called Sharon McDonald, who's a genetic counsellor who works with me a lot. Um, you've already heard about her interactions with paediatric endocrinology and paediatric orthopaedics. Terry and his team, um, you're going to hear just shortly from Maka about paediatric radiology and we're fortunate here to have good paediatric radiology as well. Um, but I think one of the things where the um, services for children with OI is different from services for many other rare conditions is that we have an excellent national network of um, uh, expert centres and the, for us the team that we work with mainly are Sheffield, um, we work with Nick a lot but also the um, next colleague Paul Arundel who um, um, is the, our local contact. And 
I think that's a very good model. Um, Nick asked a question about health and social care integration and um, these things called the STPs. Um, some people refer to them as sticky toffee pudding. They're actually sustainability and transformation plans. Um, there is a huge revolution going on at the moment in the way that health and social care works in England. Interestingly, it's not it's moving towards something which is not dissimilar to what Faisal and others in Scotland have been doing for a number of years. Um, there are some real opportunities for us there in terms of the way that healthcare is provided for people who have rare conditions, including OI. There are also some real risks, though, and, and in answer to the question, do I think that things are going to change. Yes, they are, and I have. We can perhaps at a later stage discuss that more broadly. Um, but I think what we need to do collectively, you as BBS and members of BBS, us as um, physicians and surgeons who are interested in providing services for people with OI, um, is make sure that we continue to uh, get our voices heard as to how this should work. Because actually we understand how this should work, you understand how this should work. Um, and we mustn't allow people to tell us um, things um, that we think are incorrect. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so that, that's how we work in Newcastle. Um, so that's a very quick th run through, um, a bit around genes, genetics and geneticists. I hope that was useful for some of you at least. Um, uh, these are just some pictures of Newcastle. So that um, uh, picture that Terry showed you of the Great North Children's Hospital, I'm very fortunate to be very closely involved with them. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much.